Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, let me start by saying that in this lecture I'm speaking personally and not as a representative of any organisations that I'm associated with. I say this because I know that uh, my theme, the sanctity of life law has gone too far, uh, is controversial and that reasonable people, both in this audience uh, and in the organisations with which I'm associated, have diametrically opposed opinions about this. Uh, and let me also start by saying thank you very much to Gresham College for my invitation to speak. And so to work. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty keen on running my own life, and I'm afraid I don't like other people telling me what's best for me. If I respect them, then I'm usually ready to listen to their ideas and advice, and uh, sometimes I even take such advice. But I do like to make my own decisions, uh, and especially about what's best for me. The thought of being classified as legally incapacitated to make decisions, especially about my care, the thought of becoming legally subservient to other people's decisions about what's in my best interests is to me truly appalling. Uh, I know uh, that uh, it has to happen for incapacitated people. I know that care staff uh, and nurses and many doctors and nurses and relatives who have to look after incapacitated clients, patients or relations uh, can be very kind. Uh, but the thought of becoming one of those elderly incapacitated people in their care is, to be honest, quite ghastly. So, I'm particularly keen, therefore, that if and when I'm diagnosed to be afflicted by such incapacity, uh, I'm reading quite fast because I've actually written too much, so I hope it's not too, much, too fast. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 and if I'm in that position, and it's very probably irreversible, I hope that my doctors won't prolong it by administering any life-prolonging treatments, and that includes artificial nutrition and hydration. Let me say at once that I'm not advocating suicide or euthanasia or being helped to find some Swiss euthanasiast to bump me off when I've lost or am losing my marbles. If I could, I'd vote against changing the law to permit voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted physician suicide on the grounds that I think more harm than good will probably come of it. No, I just want nature to be allowed to take its course once those marbles have rolled away in severe dementia or been smashed away by brain trauma of one sort or another. And I'd want even more strongly not to have my life prolonged if I was irrecoverably in a vegetative state, uh, alive but having no experiences at all, or else worse still, in what is now called a minimally conscious state, having some experience, some enjoyable, some unpleasant, but without ability to reason and without ability to respond to questions on the basis of reason. You might think that no sensible doctor would try to keep me going in those circumstances, especially if I'd beforehand told people about my views. A few years ago, you'd probably have been right. But my concern is that the law seems to be moving towards preventing doctors from following their patients' prior wishes to let nature take its course in this way, unless those wishes have been explicitly written into a legally valid and applicable and witness document called an advanced decision to refuse treatment, specifically life-prolonging treatment. Uh, those refusals are legally binding under the Mental Capacity Act 2005. But in the absence of such a document, mere hearsay evidence, even from family and friends who know the patient well, that an incapacitated patient would want uh, life prolonging treatment to be uh, not to be given uh, should be given very little weight when set against the legal principle of the sanctity of life. Now I'm not a lawyer, I'm a retired NHS GP as you've heard and a retired professor of medical ethics. But ethics knows no disciplinary boundaries and in any case medical ethics and medical law have an obviously close interrelationship and doctors are inevitably and, and properly obliged by our professional ethics to do the right thing for our patients. So both these perspectives have long led me to pay close attention to relevant legal matters, and it was a judgment in 2011 in the Court of Protection concerning an unfortunate woman referred to as M that most acutely prompted my concern about sanctity of life law. Although aspects of a more recent judgment in to which I'll return later in this talk about a different case, Aintree v. James, in our highest court, the Supreme Court, alleviates some of my concerns. Uh, 
The logic of my worries about the M case remains unaddressed, as I hope to demonstrate today. First, the case. In 2003, and as a result of a devastating viral brain infection, 43-year-old Ms. M felt in, fell into a coma shortly before she was about to go on a skiing trip. As time went on, she was first diagnosed as being in vegetative state, in which patients are believed to have no sort of experience at all, though they appear to be going through sleep and wake cycles. She was then reassessed and diagnosed to be in a minimally conscious state in which, as the name implies, the patient has some degree of experience, but at a minimal level. In M's case, she was able to have some pleasurable experiences, such as apparently enjoying sitting in her wheelchair in the sun. Certain music brought tears to her eyes. She seemed to respond with pleasure to certain members of staff in her care home, and she was sometimes able to respond to simple requests, such as to press a buzzer though not in a consistent way and not in a way that made any sort of conversation possible, as, for example, by responding to questions by pressing once for yes and twice for no. She occasionally spoke words, and she was able to make, uh, quotes, unintelligible groans, unquote. After the change of diagnosis to minimally conscious state in 2007, uh, intensive efforts were made in one of the world's leading neurorehabilitation hospitals in Putney in London to enhance her ability to communicate, but without success, and she was discharged back to her nursing home in the north of England, where she continued and continues to receive excellent care, as all involved agreed. However, it was clear, and again all agreed, that M had no realistic prospect of substantial improvement of her minimally conscious state, let alone, let me add, of ever getting back her capacity to make decisions for herself, including healthcare decisions. Her very loving relatives, including her mother, W, her sister, B, to whom she'd always been very close, and her loving partner of over 20 years, S, decided to apply to the Court of Protection for permission to withdraw her artificial nutrition hydration, ANH for short, though in the other case, it's CANH, Clinically Assisted Nutrition Hydration. Anyway, M's A&H was supplied through a PEG, sorry, another acronym, Percutaneous Endoscopic Gastrostomy, widely abbreviated to PEG and meaning a tube sewn into her stomach. And it was essential to, min to maintain her life. If A&H was withdrawn as requested, M would die. But her family argued that M, who'd been a very independent person, would have hated to go on being kept alive in her current and incurable state of total dependence on others, doubly incontinent, unable to do anything for herself, suffering from apparently painful contractures of her arms and legs, and manifesting hypersensitivity to being handled during her care. The application was opposed by the official solicitor, acting as her litigation friend, to protect her best interests, and opposed by the NHS Trust, which was providing her NHS care. Following a very thorough hearing of evidence on both sides, the judge ruled that it was in M's best interest to continue to be kept alive by feeding her through the peg tube sewn into her stomach. The judge unreservedly accepted the testimony of her nearest and dearest, who said that she would definitely not have wished to be kept alive any longer in such a state, but he ruled that it would be wrong to give her prior views when she was competent and independent much weight when assessing her best interest now, as the law required him to do. Her reported prior views did not specifically address the situation she was now in. She might in any case now have changed her mind, and she had not written any sort of valid and applicable advanced decision to refuse life-prolonging treatment, including artificial nutrition and hydration. Had there been such a formal, valid and applicable advanced decision, the judge acknowledged that it would have been previously legally binding under case law and would then be legally binding under statute law, provided it had conformed to, as he put it, the stringent safeguards and formalities of the Mental Capacity Act. In the absence of a valid and applicable advanced decision to refuse artificial nutrition and hydration, although the law required him to consider her previous informally expressed views, he did not give them much weight. It would, in my judgment, be wrong. What was to be given substantial weight in assessing M's best interests, explained the judge, was the sanctity of human life. In addition, the judge reiterated the requirement under Rule 9E of the Court of Protection 
that any proposal to withdraw artificial nutrition and hydration from persons in a vegetative state or in a minimally conscious state must be referred to the Court of Protection. In the meantime, such patients must continue to be provided with life-sustaining treatment, including ANH. The judgment led me to do two things. I wrote an editorial published in the British Medical Journal criticizing it, and I began to draft my own formal advance decision to refuse any life-prolonging treatment whatsoever after I'd been legally incapacitated to make such decisions about my treatment for longer than three months, and if my chances of recovering such capacity were medically assessed as very unlikely. And I go into considerable details about what I mean. But few of us will ever go to the trouble of writing such an advanced decision. If we haven't, and if we become severely and incurably mentally incapacitated, like M, in a minimally conscious state, must doctors be required to keep us alive unless, with very few exceptions, they've obtained the Court of Protection's permission to withdraw life-prolonging treatment? For that is the judgment in the M case, with its affirmation of the Court of Protection's Rule 9e. And although last year's Supreme Court judgment in the case of Aintree v. James about a patient in minimally conscious state whose relative wanted all possible life-prolonging treatments to be continued, although that uh, judgment made clear that the Court of Protection must give weight to previously expressed views of patients, even if those views have not been written into a legally binding advanced decision, uh, the Supreme Court judgment did not explicitly address the provision of ANH, nor did it address the issue of which proposals to withhold and or withdraw life-prolonging treatment must be referred to the court. My criticism in the BMJ article of the M judgment, which I'm enlarging on today, was twofold. First, I argued that it failed to give proper weight to the prior views and values of that particular incapacitated patient M. Second, I argued that even though the M case formally relates to only one specific specific individual, M, its logic produces two radical and I believe unwelcome general implications. The first is that it will cause a general undervaluing of respect for people's own informally expressed competent autonomous prior wishes concerning life belonging treatment if they become legally incapacitated in favour of the legal principle of the sanctity of life and especially doctors' legal obligation to prolong life. The second is that the logic of the judgment, if pursued, will skew medical practice towards having to provide more and more non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments, including artificial nutrition hydration, to all legally incapacitated patients whose lives would be shorter without such treatment. For, I shall argue, the logic of that judgment is that life-prolonging treatment must be provided not only to all patients in minimally conscious states, but to all legally incapacitated patients whose lives will be shorter without such treatment, with a very few exceptions. The exceptions will be futile treatment, with debate about what futile means, or that patients are eminently dying, or that such treatment would be intolerable or excessively burdensome to the patient, or that the patient has written a valid and applicable advanced decision to refuse it, or finally that the Court of Protection has ruled, exceptionally as the judge put it, that it is in the patient's best interest to withdraw such treatment. Now, of course, the judge in the M case didn't say all that. He didn't say that medical treatment should be skewed in this way. He was concerned only with a particular patient, M, and whether the particular treatment of artificial nutrition and hydration was in her particular best interest. But by confirming the Court of Protection's Rule 9e, which requires proposed decisions to withhold or withdraw life-prolonging treatment from minimally conscious patients to be referred to that court, the M judgment's logic relentlessly leads to my conclusion. For, if people in a minimally conscious state must be protected from possible mistaken decisions by doctors, by having to be, uh, by having to be referred to the Court of Protection, um, that it's not in their best interest, who would then exceptionally decide that it's not in their best interest to receive such treatment, then, uh, as the philosophers say, a fortiori, or even more strongly, uh, incompetent, uh, mentally incapacitated people who are legally incapacitated, who have higher than minimal consciousness, must be similarly protected. So if the logic of the M judgment is followed, then pending a possible court of protection decision to the contrary, life-prolonging treatment, including ANH, by tube feeding, must be provided 
with a few exceptions just mentioned, to all legally incapacitated people who can't or won't eat and drink normally and whose lives would be shorter without such life-prolonging treatment. Such patients would include all legally incapacitated people suffering from dementia, from severe and incurable brain damage of any other sort, from disseminated and incurable cancer, and indeed from any other sort of disease or damage that renders them legally incapacitated to consent to or reject life-prolonging treatment, including ANH. When the Mental Capacity Act 2005 was introduced, it looked to some of us as though it was a major move towards respecting people's prior autonomy after they became mentally incapacitated. Its requirements in Section 4 that in assessing a person's best interests, efforts should be made to ascertain that person's past and present wishes and feelings, I'm quoting here, the beliefs and values that would be likely to influence his decision if he had capacity, and the other factors that he would be likely to consider if he were able to do so, seem to manifest an indisputable concern in the Act to ensure respect for the incapacitated person's prior autonomy or self-determination. However, the judge's interpretation of the Act in the case of M belies this understanding, for as, as, at least as far as prolongation of life is concerned. In particular, the judge in the M case made clear, as I've said, that while he accepted without qualification that M had had the beliefs and values that the family reported her as having, he gave little weight to her prior views because to do so would be wrong. Thus, the judge accepted, for example, that M had told her partner, don't ever put me in a place like this, meaning a long-term nursing home such as both her grandmother and her father had been in, that she would want, quotes, to be off quick and not dependent on others, that she had told her sister that she would prefer to live 10 years less than to have to be looked after by others, that in a discussion of the Tony Bland case, she said it would be better to allow him to die. The judge accepted all that evidence, including that of her long-term partner, S, who stated that M would be, quote, horrified at being kept alive in her present state. The judge accepted the evidence of her sister, who said that her sister's life in minimally conscious state was not a life, it's an existence, and I know she wouldn't want it. Nonetheless, the judge gave these views little weight. What did carry decisive weight in the judge's opinion was the sanctity of life, Given the importance, quotes now, given the importance of the sanctity of life and the fatal consequences of withdrawing treatment and the absence of an advanced decision that complied with the requirements previously specified by the common law and now under statute, it would, in my judgment, be wrong to attach significant weight to those statements made prior to her collapse. Quoting another judge, he said, there is a very strong presumption in favour of taking all steps which will prolong life and save in exceptional circumstances or where the person is dying, the best interests of the patient will normally require such steps to be taken. And he concluded, in my judgment, the importance of preserving life is the decisive factor in this case. My own admittedly very succinct summary of this judgment is sanctity of life law trumps prior autonomy unless there's a valid and applicable advanced decision to the contrary. And my own contrary view in equally succinct summary, is that prior autonomy, even if it's not expressed in a legally valid and applicable advanced decision to refuse life-prolonging treatment, should trump sanctity of life law. So what about the counter-arguments to my own position? Let me summarise seven. I told you it was a long paper. A fundamentalist objection is that human life is sacred, hence the origin of the phrase the sanctity of life, and must never be taken and, where possible, must be prolonged. I don't propose to argue with that view, although I have elsewhere pointed out A, its implausibility, and B, the awful effects on our society and our health service if the prolongation of human life became an absolute obligation. Our law does not adopt this position, and very few people do. Two, nonetheless, helping people to survive who would otherwise die is a widely acknowledged moral value, and some would argue that it's both the main moral value in general and the main moral purpose of medicine in particular. Correspondingly, not being killed and being helped to stay alive comprise together a fundamental human right, the right to life, which is enshrined in international declarations of human rights and in national laws, including UK laws. Three, a counter-argument linked to the previous one is that so 
called allowing people to die by deliberately not giving them life-prolonging treatment and especially by withholding food and water is actually killing them. Withholding and withdrawing of, quote, so-called artificial nutrition and hydration is in reality starving and droughting people to death. Droughting someone is my neologism for deliberately depriving that person of water, just as starving someone is deliberately depriving the person of food. Such deliberate starving and droughting people to death are particularly heinous, heartless and callous ways of killing people and should be unthinkable for all but especially for doctors. Four, a further though linked counter-argument to my position is A, it's morally repugnant to ration any sort of life prolonging treatment and B, even if scarcity of resources for healthcare does occasionally require that some very, perhaps very expensive life prolonging treatments must be rationed, Artificial nutrition and hydration must never be withheld on grounds of scarce resources. There is something morally special about providing life-sustaining food and water that makes the idea of withholding and or withdrawing artificial nutrition and hydration from minimally conscious patients on the grounds of rationing, including on the grounds of opportunity cost, utterly morally repugnant, as one blogger responded to my BMJ editorial, though in rather more abusive terms than those I've just offered on his behalf. Five, another justice counter-argument is that allowing severely disabled people such as M to die when people with normal abilities will be kept alive is a pernicious form of unjust discrimination against disabled people. For others to assess that the pleasures or other benefits derived by people like M from their admittedly limited sensate lives, uh, to, for others to judge that they, these pleasures are not sufficient to justify keeping them alive Quotes, represents grave discrimination against disabled people. Uh, quote from a particular article in the Journal of Medical Ethics Symposium on the M case back in September last year. Uh, six, a philosophical counter-argument is that the person in minimally conscious state is no longer the same person as the competent autonomous person he or she previously was. And so the views of that previous competent person are of no relevance to the treatment of the current incapacitated person. Seven, finally, as the judge in the M case argued, the person in minimally conscious state may have changed his or her mind. Well, in this talk, uh, I'll give you only summary responses to the counter-arguments. Of course, each one of them uh, has, as the judge in the M case put it, much ink spilt on it. I've already summarised my response to the first vitalist counter-argument that human life is of absolute value and prolonging people's lives as far as possible is an absolute moral obligation. Fortunately, this implausibly absolutist view is not widely held and certainly not a part of UK law, despite the misleading use in English law of the term sanctity of human life. What about the second non-absolutist counter-argument? It does actually seem obviously right, doesn't it? based as it is on everyone's right to life and on doctors' ethical obligation to preserve life. But that argument needs careful analysis. Of course, trying to keep people alive is usually an integral and literally vital moral objective of medicine. And of course, the right to life is a hugely important moral and legal right. And of course, doctors start from, as the GMC put it, the General Medical Council, a presumption in favour of prolonging life. But medicine's astonishing recent developments have increasingly facilitated doctors' ability to keep people alive in a state that they themselves do not, or would not, when they were able to make such assessments, consider worth living. In curable vegetative state, what used to be called permanent or persistent vegetative state, or PVS, in which a patient has no experience at all but goes through apparent sleep-wake cycles, is widely agreed to be a state of living that very few people would wish to have prolonged. But there are some who vigorously assert they would wish to have their lives prolonged, even if they were reliably diagnosed to be in PVS. Since the Bland case of a young man who was crushed during the Hillsborough Stadium disaster and went into PVS, English law permits the withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment, including artificial nutrition and hydration, from patients in PVS if a court decides that such treatment is not in the patient's best interests. The main justification for such withdrawal is that such treatment can provide no benefit to the PVS patient and is therefore futile. 
hydration. Uh, uh, the law lords also ruled in the Bland case that artificial nutrition hydration was a medical treatment and that withdrawal of non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments, including artificial nutrition hydration, was lawful and did not constitute homicide. Those rulings were confirmed in statute law by the Mental Capacity Act. The current moral and legal debate is about benefits of life-sustaining treatments, including A and H, to patients like M, who have severely impaired consciousness, minimally conscious state, rather than to patients like Bland in PVS with no consciousness. Two moral and legal questions are relevant. First, must people who, when competent, have expressed as M did, but not in a legally binding way, views and values which make it clear that they would reject having their lives prolonged in such states, nonetheless be compulsorily kept alive, as the judge in the M case ruled? And the second question is whether, even if people would want or would have wanted to keep their lives prolonged in such minimally conscious states, must those wishes necessarily be carried out? Should it be legally obligatory to provide them with life prolonging treatments? And if so, which treatments and at what cost and what opportunity cost to others? I'll come back to that when I respond to the rationing and justice objections. But for the time being, let me stay with the right to life and medicine's moral objectives. It is important to distinguish two components of the right to life. The first is the negative right not to be killed, and the second is the positive right to have one's life prolonged. Even the right not to be killed is not an absolute one. Think of self-defence and defence of others. But though not absolute, it is a very strong moral and legal right, and the corresponding moral and legal obligation not to kill others is a very strong obligation that we prima facie owe to all other people, or at least to all other people who are not aggressors. But the second component of the right to life, the positive right to be kept alive, is obviously far more restricted. For a start, we can't possibly owe it to everybody whose life could be extended because we couldn't possibly provide the necessary assistance to stay alive to everybody who needs it. And moral and legal obligations should, at least in principle, be fulfillable. Even if we restrict the scope of this positive right to life, for example, in the case of NHS treatment to those entitled to NHS care, Still, there will be the problem of competing claims for scarce resources, including not only other claims for life-prolonging resources, uh, but also other claims for health-enhancing interventions that are not life-prolonging, for hip replacements or for psychological therapies, for example. Again, this is a justice issue, which I'll address shortly, but so far as the right to life and the duty of doctors to prolong life is concerned, yes, there is a widely accepted right to life, but while the negative right not to be killed applies prima facie to all people who are not aggressors, the positive right to have one's life prolonged is necessarily restricted, both in scope and extent. And as medicine extends its technological power to prolong people's lives in states that many people would regard not wish to extend, including incurable vegetative state and minimally conscious states, but also including, for example, incurable severe dementia, and incurable and disabling disseminated cancer. There is a growing need for non-doctors especially to be aware that sometimes prolongation of life does not actually benefit patients and that medical technology has ever increasing ability to keep people alive in states like PVS and minimally conscious states that many people would not wish to have prolonged by medicine and its technologies, even if they haven't written a legally valid and applicable document to refuse such treatment. The next objection was that allowing to die is killing, uh, both morally and legally. Again, there's a huge literature on this issue, but my summary response is that sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Philosophers such as James Rachels and John Harris have established conclusively that there's no necessary moral distinction to be made between killing and letting die. And the law makes it just as clear that in some circumstances, allowing to die, in quotes, can be homicide. Let me offer an obvious example, if unrealistic, I hope. If a doctor deliberately omits to treat his diabetic patient with insulin needed to prevent him from dying in a diabetic coma, and to make the point very obvious, let's say the doctor does this because he's having an affair with a patient's wife and sees a wonderful opportunity to get rid of her husband, then that doctor is morally 
culpable as if he'd deliberately killed the patient by injecting poison and probably also as legally culpable. And he won't get out of a guilty verdict, either morally or legally, by pleading that he was only allowing the patient to die. But just because there's no necessary moral distinction between killing and letting die doesn't follow that there necessarily are never moral distinctions to be made between killing and letting die. To adapt an ancient philosopher's thought experiment originally offered by Philip of Foot, if I omit to send money to Oxfam and as a result someone in the third world dies of starvation who would otherwise have been saved that I sent that money, that may or may not be morally culpable, depends on what, whether you think I'm morally obliged to send money to Oxfam. But it's clearly morally different from, and less morally culpable, if it's morally culpable at all, from my deliberately sending poisoned food parcels to that part of the world, perhaps to demonstrate a philosophical point. In medicine, it's widely acknowledged, most obviously in the specialty of palliative care, that the objective of prolonging people's lives, even if it can be achieved at least for a while by life-prolonging treatments, may sometimes cause too much of a burden, either for the patient or for others, who would be deprived of the scarce resources required. Let me give you a different example. Neurosurgical intensive care wards regularly look after unconscious patients who have sustained massive and catastrophic head injuries. The doctors and nurses will have instituted maximal life-prolonging treatment as they attempt to diagnose and then remedy the brain damage. Sometimes it becomes clear that the patient's brain damage is irremediable and life-prolonging measures including fluids, nutrition and mechanical ventilation are withdrawn even though the patient would have gone on living longer had these life-prolonging treatments been continued. This is not widely regarded as either ethically or legally as killing the patient, as starving or droughting or suffocating the patient to death. It is regarded, in my view correctly regarded, as allowing the patient to die. And the morally and legally relevant cause of the patient's death is the massive brain damage he or she has sustained, not the doctor's withdrawal of life-prolonging treatment. So no, allowing to die is not necessarily morally or legally the same as killing, and it certainly isn't when doctors allow patients to die because they cannot benefit those patients any longer by prolonging their lives. And so to the two justice objections, discrimination against disabled people and the problem of rationing scarce life-prolonging resources and especially of rationing artificial nutrition hydration. Let me invert the order and deal first with the discrimination counter-argument. It asserts that withholding life-prolonging treatments from patients in minimally conscious states, when uh, one would not withhold it in patients with normally conscious states, manifests immoral discrimination against disabled people. I respond by going back to the earlier issue of benefit and asserting that the basic moral purpose of any medical intervention is the ancient Hippocratic medical commitment to aim to provide net health-related benefit with minimal harm. In modern times, this Hippocratic commitment is supplemented by the additional moral qualifications of doing so in ways that respect the autonomy of and are just and fair to all those potentially affected. By definition, all legally incapacitated patients are not in a state in which they then have sufficient, if any, autonomy. But as I've just argued, their prior autonomy, prima facie, ought to be respected, even if it has not been expressed in a legally valid and applicable document. So the first issue to be addressed is would the CAN, the Clinically Assisted Nutrition Hydration, provide net health benefit with minimal harm? With non-disabled persons, we'd ask the patient. One way of reducing discrimination against inadequately autonomous or non-autonomous disabled people is to respect their prior autonomous views, even if these haven't been expressed in a valid and applicable advanced decision. And conversely, failing to respect their previously expressed competent views does discriminate against them. But of course, people's views about life-prolonging treatment in incurably minimally conscious state will depend to a large extent on whether they believe that prolongation of life is a benefit in itself or is instead a means to an end, that end being a life that the person concerned would consider worth prolonging. My own view, as I've indicated, is that prolongation of life is not a good in itself, 
though usually, but not always, it's a means of achieving such a good. That, of course, is in no way to deny the obvious fact that life, being alive, is a necessary condition of having a life that the person living that life does or would consider worth living and prolonging. But though being alive is a necessary condition for having a life that one considers worth living, it is not a sufficient condition. For many of us, a life in permanently vegetative state is not a life worth living, and so too for many of us is a life in minimally conscious state even worse. Emily Jackson, a professor of medical law, movingly interprets M's plight along these lines, in stark contrast to the judge's optimistic interpretation of her state. But of course, some people do believe having their lives prolonged for as long as possible, no matter what the quality of their lives might be, is a benefit, and they would want life-prolonging treatments to be provided for as long as possible. The Aintree v. James case, which I'll discuss briefly in a few minutes, is a very recent Supreme Court case about just such a patient. That judgment offers some welcome clarification of the Mental Capacity Act and to some extent potentially allays, if lawyers and judges interpret the Act similarly, um, some, though not all, of the worries I've been discussing. But the judgment does reiterate and make clear that under the Mental Capacity Act it is unlawful to discriminate against patients on the basis of any disability. The Act requires that the treatment of all incapacitated patients must be based on their best interests. It is, however, true that all legally incapacitated people are at a disadvantage compared with those who have a capacity and thus the legal right to make decisions for themselves. It's also true that those who make decisions on behalf of incapacitated people may make the wrong decisions as those of us who oppose the judge's decision in the M case believe the judge did, and of course vice versa. But that is not a problem of discrimination against disabled people. It's a problem inflicted on disabled people by their disability that renders them inadequately autonomous to make their own decisions. And so to rationing, and especially rationing of artificial nutrition hydration. Uh, the idea that it's repugnant to ration life-prolonging treatment. My response to the first part of this argument is that, of course, rationing of health, scarce health resources is necessary. And if life-prolonging treatments are to be immune from such rationing, the inevitable result must be that fewer resources will be available for health care that improves but doesn't sustain or prolong life. It seems clear that medicine's ability to pr produce beneficial treatments of one sort or another grows year on year. So too, an ability to produce some treatments of doubtful benefit. It seems equally clear that the capacity and or willingness of societies to pay more and more for health care does not grow at the same rate. So rationing is and will continue to be necessary, QED. <laughs> Amongst the rationing decisions, or allocation decisions as some prefer to call them, uh, are choices between allocating resources to life-prolonging treatments or to non-life-prolonging treatments. Perhaps the most widely discussed examples are ever-improving life-prolonging treatments for advanced cancer, vying for NHS resources for, for example, mental health treatments or joint replacements to treat pain and mobility problems. There are huge debates, of course, about the best ways of making such allocation decisions, uh, about the use of such measures as cost per quality or per dally, that's the cost per quality adjusted life year or per disability adjusted life year gained by a treatment. But so long as there are insufficient resources to pay for all available beneficial healthcare treatments, and it seems safe to assume that this will always be the case, then painful and unwelcome rationing decisions uh, or allocation decisions will be necessary. Uh, while my first worry about the M judgment was that it ignored incapacitated people's prior autonomy, my second worry was that its emphasis on the sanctity of life would skew the allocation of healthcare resources towards prolongation of life and away from healthcare that improves but doesn't prolong life. In this regard, I was greatly encouraged by the Supreme Court's judgment in Aintree v. James uh, that stated that neither patients nor the court of protection acting on their behalf could instruct doctors on what treatments they had to provide. And I'll quote, this act, the Mental Capacity Act, is concerned with enabling the court to do for the patient what he could do for himself if of full capacity. But it goes no further. 
On an application under this act, therefore, the court has no greater powers than the patient would have if he were full capacity. Uh, the, the first judge said a patient cannot order a doctor to give a particular form of treatment, though he may refuse it. The court's position is no different. And the judgment went on to reiterate a previous judgment that stated, quote, Ultimately, however, a patient cannot demand that a doctor administer a treatment which the doctor considers is adverse to the patient's clinical needs. Of course, there are circumstances, the judgment went on, in which a doctor's common law duty of care towards his patient requires him to administer a particular treatment. But it is not the role of the court of protection to decide that, nor is that court concerned with the legality of NHS policy or guidelines for the provision of particular treatments. Its role is to decide whether a particular treatment is in the best interests of a patient who is incapable of making the decision for himself. So plainly the Supreme Court is stating that it's not the role of the Court of Protection to tell doctors what treatments they must give, nor to tell health authorities how to prioritise their resources, e.g. in favour of life prolonging treatments. I find that reassuring. But what the Supreme Court judgment does not address is the contrary logic that I pointed to before of Rule 9E, which, as I've outlined it, says that if the serious treatment, as it calls it, of proposed withholding or withdrawing of life-prolonging treatment, including artificial nutrition and, and or hydration, for legally incapacitated patients in minimally conscious states must be referred to the Court of Protection, then, as I said, a fortiori, the same should be the case for all legally incapacitated patients, including those who have greater than minimal consciousness. And while it's true that the judgments of the Court of Protection are about individual patients, the rationale used by judges in those judgments is bound to be generalised in practice and acted on by doctors and health authorities. Furthermore, the rules of the Court of Protection are, so it seems to this non-lawyer, general rules. And Rule 9e is a general rule that includes general instructions about types of cases of serious treatment that must be referred to the court. So it's not clear to me that the Supreme Court in Aintree v. James has relieved my worries that the logic of the M judgment, including its endorsement of Rule 9e, implies that A and H must be provided to all legally incapacitated patients, with a few types of exception I mentioned, until and unless the Court of Protection rules otherwise in particular cases, and that as a result, the allocation of healthcare resources will in practice be skewed towards life prolongation, thus reducing the resources available for life, non-life prolonging treatments. The second part of this counter-argument <coughs> is that even if rationing of life prolonging treatments is sometimes necessary, provision of food and water, including food and water delivered by tube feeding of various sorts, is morally special and must never be deliberately withheld or withdrawn if it's needed to prolong life. Unlike his predecessor, Pope Pius XII, Pope, Pope John Paul II certainly stated that this was the case in an address to a congress organised jointly by the Pontifical Academy for Life and the International Federation of Catholic Medical Associations, he called the withdrawing of artificial nutrition hydration from patients in vegetative state euthanasia by omission and, quotes, a serious violation of the law of God. And of course, if it's euthanasia and contrary to God's law for PVS patients, then it's euthanasia and contrary to God's law for patients in minimally conscious states. I'm not a Roman Catholic. Let me declare my own background in this connection. I'm an atheist Jew educated in an ancient and excellent Church of England boarding school, Christ's Hospital. But I found that papal statement, John Paul's, inconsistent with Pope Pius XII's famous doctrine of ordinary and extraordinary means which interestingly was also delivered to doctors back in 1957 in relation to the use of the then newly developed artificial respirators. Years ago, I praised that doctrine of ordinary and extraordinary means as a statement of common sense morality relevant to all of us, regardless of our religion or lack of it. To this self-acknowledged outsider, Pope John Paul's assertion that A&H was always morally obligatory actually ignored the advice of his predecessor and furthermore, everything that John Paul said in justification of his view that A&H was always morally obligatory because food and water were basic and essential to life 
was equally true of air, which is also basic and essential to life. His predecessor made it clear in relation to respirators that they were not always morally obligatory, that whether a life-prolonging medical intervention was ordinary and therefore morally obligatory, or extraordinary and therefore morally optional, all depended on the burdens and benefits, quotes, to self or others, unquote. Careful assessment along these lines enabled doctors and others to decide whether, in a particular case, the medical provision of air by means of a ventilator, what I've called artificial aeration, to make the similarity clear, was an ordinary means, and thus morally obligatory, or whether it was an extraordinary means, and therefore permissible to withhold or withdraw. Well, I don't expect to convince Roman Catholic listeners about my interpretation of papal statements. The important practical point is that in the UK, not a Roman Catholic country for a few hundred years, artificial nutrition and hydration are regarded as medical interventions that in some circumstances are not legally obligatory, even when death will result if they aren't provided. This was established by the House of Lords when they permitted withdrawal of ANH in their judgment in the case of Tony Bland, the Hill, who went into PVS after the Hillsborough disaster. The law lords agreed that it was not in Bland's best interest to continue to be provided with ANH. But recognising that withdrawing or withholding ANH was a contentious issue about which there were strongly opposed religious and cultural views, religious op opposition was and is by no means restricted to Roman Catholics, who were themselves divided about the issue, the law lords advise in their ruling that it will be good practice for any withholding and withdrawing of ANH from patients and PVS to be referred to the courts. And as I've said, more recently, Rule 9E of the Court of Protection requires such referral to the Court of Protection if the patient is in minimally conscious state as well as in PVS. In its advice on the end-of-life care, general, the General Medical Council advises doctors of these legal obligations. Otherwise, its advice in general concerning all legally incapacitated patients who can't eat and drink normally and who are not imminently dying which means that their death isn't expected within hours or days, is nuanced, but heavily weighted towards an assessment of overall benefit in the light of patients' own preferences. You must provide, says the GMC, clinically assisted nutrition or hydration if it would be of overall benefit to them, taking into account the patient's beliefs and values, any previously expressed uh, views about their care. The patient's request must be given weight and when the benefits, burdens and risks are finely balanced, uh, they will usually be the deciding factor. Even when patients are imminently dying, if they've previously requested or those close to them are sure that they would have wanted ANH until they actually died, then, quotes, the patient's wishes must be given weight. And when the benefits, burdens and risks are finely balanced will usually be the deciding factor. In cases where doctors judge that providing or continuing to provide clinically assisted nutrition and hydration would not be in the patient's overall benefit, uh, having assessed the patient's nutrition and hydration needs separately, doctors should explain this to the patient, if appropriate, and to those close to them and respond to any questions or concerns they express. In addition, doctors should take all reasonable steps to get a second opinion from a senior clinician, clinician who might be in a different specialty, i.e. a senior nurse. My own interpretation of this advice is that the GMC recognises, as do the UK courts, that while clinically assisted nutrition and hydration is a type of medical treatment, any proposed withholding or withdrawing of food or, and or water, even when this is delivered by medical means such as PEG tubes or intravenous catheters, also tubes, uh, is a highly sensitive and emotive issue in which the patient's own views and the views of those close to the patient must be given very great weight. From the point of view of assessing an individual's best interests, this seems entirely sensible and morally defensible advice. What is not sensible, in my view, and difficult to defend morally, is the assumption that provision of clinically assisted nutrition hydration is always beneficial, always of overall benefit. But if a person has a strong belief, as of course religious beliefs often are, then he ought to be given artificial hydration and nutrition uh, in those circumstances in which they're needed to keep him alive. And that such provision ought to continue until either he dies or recovers sufficiently and no longer needs it, 
then that individual's person's best interests are likely to be honoured by following his wishes. However, it's important for doctors to advise the patient and or his family and supporters about the actual likely clinical benefits and harms of provision or not lack of provision uh, of that life-sustaining treatment. Now, what about this notion that it's not the same person when you're in clinically um, minimally conscious state? I propose to deal very briefly with the last two counter-arguments. You'll be relieved to hear. Um, not the same person, and if the same person may have changed his or her mind. <clears throat> While the philosophical issue of personal identity is highly complex and contended, clearly the law does not consider that legally incapacitated person uh, is a different person from when he was uh, capacitous. For the Mental Capacity Act requires the valid and applicable, and valid and applicable advanced decision to refuse life prolonging treatments to be honoured. So they obviously, in the law, you are the same person. Similarly, might have changed his or her mind, counter-argument, applies equally to valid and applicable advanced decisions. Yet these must, by law, be honoured. In the case of best interest assessments, I am not claiming that prior autonomous or competent views must be honoured, as in the same way as advanced decisions must be honoured. I'm only claiming that a person's informally expressed prior autonomous views should be given significant weight when assessing his or her best interests. If there's evidence that the person has changed his or her mind, then that should be considered in the balancing exercise of factors favouring and disfavouring continuing treatment of a legally incapacitated person. So to conclude my lecture, phew, uh, I hope I've convinced, or at least some of you, that the judgment in the M case, combined with its endorsement of Rule 9E of the Court of Protection, does threaten to skew provision of medical treatment towards provision of life-prolonging treatment, especially in the context of provision of clinically assisted nutrition hydration, which, according to the logic of that judgment, should be provided with very few exceptions that I mentioned, to all legally incapacitated patients whose lives will be prolonged by it and who have not refused such treatment in a written, valid and applicable advanced decision, or until and unless the Court of Protection rules otherwise. And I hope I've convinced you that the M judgment gave excessive weight to sanctity of life law and far too little weight to the previously expressed autonomous views of legally incapacitated patients. My hope is that the Supreme Court's judgment in Aintree v. James will alleviate both of these problems by its reiteration that according to the Mental Capacity Act's criteria for assessment of best interests, a person's prior informally expressed views and values, even about life-sustaining treatment, must be taken seriously, and by its reiteration that the Court of Protection cannot order doctors to provide treatments that do not that they do not believe would be appropriate, any more than individual patients can do so. Nor can it tell health authorities how to allocate their resources. But given my arguments about the logical implications of Rule 9e and its requirements that proposals must be referred to the court, uh, I can only hope that I'll be proved wrong about my assertion that sanctity of life law has gone too far. Meanwhile, it might be sensible for any of you who share my worries to write an advanced decision. <clears throat>